Good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining us today for the seventh and final Youth Access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force. We are coming to you today from FAA headquarters in Washington, D.C., on Zoom and on the FAA's YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter live streams. For any reporters joining us on the live stream, please note that all discussions are for background only. A video archive of the event will be available on the FAA social media accounts after the meeting ends. So now I will read the Federal Advisory Committee Act statement. This meeting is being held pursuant to a notice published in the Federal Register on July 12, 2022. The agenda for this meeting was announced in that notice with details as set out in the agenda posted on the FAA committee website. I am the designated federal officer responsible for compliance with the Federal Advisory Committee Act, under which the meeting is conducted. It is my responsibility to see to it that the agenda is adhered to and that accurate minutes are kept. I also have the responsibility to adjourn the meeting should I find it necessary to do so in the public interest. Only youth access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force members are and may participate in any discussions and vote on matters put on vote by the chair. So moving on, recognize the importance of this task force. The FAA Acting Administrator would like to take this opportunity to provide welcoming marks. Thank you, Acting Administrator Nolan, for joining us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Angela. And then thank you and good morning, everyone. Um, you know, aviation has come roaring back from the pandemic. Um, the growth and innovation we're seeing in the whole airspace sector continues to just be astounding for us all. But our industry, this industry needs to recruit the next generation workforce. And this means for us reaching young people early and showing them career possibilities. Otherwise, we'll lose them to other careers. And thank you for the work that you've done to each of you, and we are well positioned to bring more young people on board. I want to thank you all for serving on this task force and also thank the chair, Sharon DeVee, uh, both for your leadership and Angela Anderson for serving as the designated federal officer. Two years ago, when you all came together uh, to address the workforce shortages in, aviation, in the aviation industry and meet a specific purpose to encourage high, high school students to pursue careers in aviation and find ways for them to get the technical education and training needed and also identify apprenticeships, mentoring, and other pathways for them to be successful. Your work has been essential. This industry needs pilots, air traffic controllers, aviation maintenance technicians, and many, many other professionals. The need was there before the pandemic. Now it is even greater. As COVID-19 hastened the retirement of many people throughout the industry. But we also need skills that didn't uh, that we didn't need even 10 or 20 years ago. We need drone pilots, cybersecurity specialists, data analysts, and more. And we're making historic investments to strengthen aviation's infrastructure and flight and fight uh, climate change while creating countless jobs in the process. Indeed, this is an exciting time to be in the aerospace field. It's hard to predict exactly how this industry will evolve in the next decade. But as Abraham Lincoln once said, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Because of your work, we are in a position to create a future in which we have highly skilled, diverse workforce that's ready to succeed in this dynamic sector. Because of your work, your insights and recommendations will help the aerospace community improve its career and education outreach efforts, particularly for people in underserved communities, and also look at funding opportunities to develop careers. We want the door of aviation and aerospace to be open for, to people from all walks of life. When we have people with different backgrounds, perspectives, and skill sets, we will be more successful. We'll make better decisions innovate at a greater rate and solve problems faster. At the FAA, we have we know that having a diverse workforce makes aviation safer. This past June, the FAA launched a media campaign titled BATC, 
to get the word out far and wide about becoming an air traffic controller. Social media influences helped us reach millions more. We received five times more applications and a much more diverse applicant pool than in previous years, exceeding our own expectations. Later this year, the FAA will award a second round of workforce grants totaling $10 million to develop future pilot and aviation maintenance technicians. We've also partnered with historically black colleges and universities and the Hispanic Association of Colleges and Universities, and we've connected with tribal nations too. The FAA runs a robust minority serving institutions intern program with about 200 students participating this year from across the nation. And we've adopted a dozen elementary schools around the country, introducing fourth graders to aerospace careers and concepts. It's essentially the whole aerospace community working together to multiply our outreach efforts and to make them more effective. Your recommendations will help us do it. Again, the FAA and the Department of Transportation deeply appreciate the countless hours you all have devoted to this task force, and we will consider your recommendations fully. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. We appreciate it. And so next we will have a video from Secretary Pete. Hello, I wanna start by thanking all of you for your service and for your work on this critical issue, especially my colleagues at FAA and our task force members from across the country and across the industry. I know many of you have been working at this for a number of years and we are grateful. Aviation has long been central to America's economy, our history, and our own personal stories, as boarding a plane is the start of so many of our greatest adventures and most important memories. In the last year, we have been thrilled that we've reached a place where Americans again have the income and the inclination to safely take to the skies once more. But we've also been reminded that aviation workers are the most important part of aviation. And we're seeing the problems that arise when staffing levels and hiring can't keep up with demand. For the long-term good of the aviation sector, and therefore the long-term good of the American economy, we need more young people entering this field now than ever. These are good paying careers, and we want more students to get involved, including those who may not have automatically known that aviation had a place for them. Students who don't always see themselves represented in aviation. There is still a lack of diversity today and barriers to entry can be costly. We need to do more to open these doors and help a diverse range of young people walk through them all the way to the flight deck. It's an important part of how we can keep the entire industry strong and safe for decades to come. We know that the interest is out there. I've spoken to young people, including in communities of color who are building skills and exploring careers in aviation and aerospace related fields. It's actually been one of the best parts of this job, speaking with young people at places like the Baltimore Drone Academy, Fly Compton in Los Angeles, the Aviate Academy in Arizona, and Davis Aerospace and Maritime High School in Cleveland, to name a few. Just last week at Texas Southern University's Aviation Science Management Program in Houston, I saw the passion of the students who were there ready for a bright future in this field. There are so many promising future pilots, mechanics, engineers and others out there across the country. We're gonna find them, support them, and build the pathways for them into these good paying and important careers. Right now, America cannot leave any talent on the table if we are to succeed as a country. And I appreciate your help identifying and confronting the barriers that we need to tear down. The pandemic has created some of the most challenging moments for transportation in generations. But through the investments that we're making, using the package that the president signed in the bipartisan infrastructure law, we're also at the outset of one of the greatest opportunities for transportation in US history, building up infrastructure that will serve Americans for generations to come. And young people today are going to be at the heart of all of this. We're very much looking forward to seeing your recommendations. And I again want to thank you for the work that you've done. I know not just as a policymaker, but as a frequent flyer, that I'm going to be among those benefiting from the work you've done to help create pathways for a new generation to thrive in aviation careers from the hangar to the desktop to the cockpit. 
Thank you again. Okay, we're back. <laughs> well, welcome everyone. It's um, it's so nice to see so many of you in person, and I can see uh, our other task force members in the little boxes that we're used to. Um, you know, at some point, maybe we we can all get together in the middle of the country <laughs> for a barbecue. Uh, and it's just been such a pleasure and a lot of hard work. So thank you to everyone who's been involved in this. So before we get into the, the heart of the matter, um, I need a motion to approve the minutes from the last public meeting. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, terrific, the minutes pass. Okay, so, you know, two short years mm -hmm. of work. Um, <laughs> It, it's, it went really fast. Uh, you know, I think fortunately for some of us, it happened during the pandemic when we had a little more space in our lives. And as Tamara reminded me, that's all gone now. <laughs> so uh, I really appreciate the work that you did, especially in your subcommittees. You know, I know many of you met weekly. Uh, you have formed lifelong bonds around the work that we've done. And it made putting the report together uh, so much easier because the data was there, the information was there. Uh, it really, it helped to knit it together quite easily. I'd also like to thank our FAA partners in all of this. Um, you served, and I see one of our subject matter experts here, Chris Sharp, you know, the FAA folks served as subject matter experts for us, Angela, Twee, who I know is on the on the Zoom today, Aaliyah, who's who's moved on to another job, uh, Lindsay, the marketing and communications team. Thank you. We could not have done this without you, and really appreciate your help and support. Um, and also everybody in, from the Aviation Space Education Office, who's going to be really important in all of this work going forward. So I know you have 21 people who are ready to pitch in at any point. So please feel free to call on us. Uh, Okay, into the recommendations. Uh, so the, the final report will come out later today. Uh, don't use the length task force numbers that I sent you. We found a few typos, a really funny one <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> So um, I'll send that out as soon as the meeting's over. Uh, all right, so building a, a brighter future. This is our youth access to, aviate, to American jobs and aviation report. Do we want to put it up? Did you want to put it up on the screen? Okay. All right, first slide. So in case we forgot who we are, <laughs> here's a quick reminder. Well, you know, two years from now when you're looking at the report for something, because that's what's going to happen, right? You go, oh yeah, they were on it with me. So, um, you know, really representative of the entire industry, right? We've got folks from youth-facing organizations, government, uh, associations, education, training, competitions, uh, just really was a terrific group to work with in terms of bringing perspective to all the recommendations that we put together. Next slide. Just a reminder about what our charter was, even though we changed it a little bit. Uh, I don't think that, I think that's okay. We did do what we were supposed to, we did more. Uh, so the idea is that we're supposed to develop independent recommendations that facilitate and encourage high school students. We know we went far younger than that uh, and how we get them to training and higher education, uh, how we encourage these students to enroll in a course of study related specifically to an aviation career, and how do, I how do we identify and develop pathways for students uh, to go after apprenticeships, uh, workforce development programs, or careers? Next slide. And then just a reminder about the description of our duties. Uh, we were to identify industry trends, look at efforts to coordinate uh, how we support youth, identify methods of enhancing apprenticeships, job skill training, mentorship, education, outreach, and also look at the all important and probably the area that we struggled the most with, as you can, as I'm sure folks out there can imagine, is around the funding issue, which is complicated and hard and has been and probably will continue to be. Next slide. 
So our approach to the work was really to take um, those areas that we were asked to look at and form subcommittees. So this is the listing of the subcommittees and their specific charges. So we had a trends subcommittee yet led by Yvette Rose to really look at uh, those trends that encourage and discourage youth from pursuing a career, building awareness. How can we all work together, all the various stakeholders to support youth in pursuing careers? How can we expand the pathways, identify specific hands-on, in many cases, approaches um, and mentorship that we can undertake to really reach out to youth and then funding. Uh, so building awareness was led by Joey Collar and Whitney Dix, expanded pathways by Ryan Gertson and funding by Dr. Ralph Coppola. Next slide. Okay, so as we heard the administrator talk just a few minutes ago and also um, Secretary Pete about the workforce shortage. It's so funny because when we had our very first meeting, I quoted the Boeing 2020 report and then we updated it for this one. And it's the same, if not worse, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we've recovered. Um, we came roaring back far faster than anybody anticipated, I think. And because of retirements and uh, the attraction of any career right now, right? We are really battling and fighting uh, to secure a workforce. Uh, the competition to recruit top talent, retain top talent, uh, is only going to get harder. And then this was also backed up this year by the Oliver Wyman study uh, that looked at the really tight labor market and be goes beyond just having enough crews. We all know that in this room. You know, it's everything from, you know, the folks on the ramp to the folks in the airport who are running the concessions, uh, security agents, everybody that's really in engaged and involved in the aviation industry. And they also pointed out in their study, 85% of senior executives said new hires was their biggest challenge. And I know many of you, as I have in the last two years, served on panels, right, to talk about this issue and everybody's desperate for, tell me the secret. <laughs> how, do I, how do I recruit more young people? How do I attract and retain? those folks. Well, we have some answers. So, all right, next slide. Um, also, the McKinsey report looked at unfilled positions, um, losing staff, and the issue of pay rate, right? When you make $20 an hour working at a coffee store, right, there has to be um, something that draws you and attracts you to a different kind of career. Uh, so this is something we have to pay attention to. We know for too long, the vast majority of individuals involved in aviation and aerospace have been over, overwhelmingly male and overwhelmingly white. And a lot of that is around the fact that we are such a mysterious field, right? Unless you know somebody, which is typically your uncle, brother, cousin, grandfather uh, in the field, you tend not to know about it. So the numbers for women, we all know, you know, less than 10%, the numbers for underrepresented groups, even worse. Uh, so we really have to undertake, um, you know, an understanding of this is a aviation and aerospace. And I know we all share this viewpoint is transformative. It can be transformative for students and their families. So how do we make sure that story is told across the nation in a really, um, intentional kind of way? And how do we provide ongoing education, commitment and action, particularly by those in power to expand opportunities for everyone? Next slide. And we know how, and that how is we have to reach out to underrepresented groups. They're gonna help us solve the workforce shortage. We have to create awareness in those communities. We have to create a diverse, equitable, and inclusive industry that's critical to achieving our long-term goals. We have to create awareness at the middle and elementary school levels to create greater engagement at the high school level. We can't wait until they're in high school to get to them. We have to feed that pipeline so when they're in high school, they can take advantage of dual enrollment programs and credentialing programs, things I'll talk about in a few minutes. We have to create a sense of belonging. Students have to see themselves in the industry. Um, you have to see it to be it, as astronaut Sally Bride said. Um, and they have to know that the pathway is affordable. So for so many of the things that we offer in aviation, there's a credential or a certification with a financial price tag that's a barrier. So we have to figure out a way to help those students support it. Next slide. Okay, 
So the approach to the recommendations, they really fall into four major categories. The first is around early awareness and engagement. The fact that we have to start young. I'm gonna say this a lot. Uh, our research found that 10 and 18 were two of the big points uh, to really get students interested and then into the industry. And so what do we do to get them at 10? And then what do we do to keep them between 10 and 18? <clears throat> Information access, the internet is the answer. Uh, and it has to be in, a, in one place, a centralized location. Collaboration, how do we keep working together after this task force is done? We, and I'll talk about that in a second. We, we have a set of recommendations around that and I'm gonna repeat them a lot. <laughs> and then there's the issue around finances, right? How do we help both individuals and aviation youth serving organizations that are doing a lot of the heavy lift here um, to have a consistent funding stream? So what we hope the report will provide is a roadmap for implementation uh, for really specific constituents, education, uh, industry, youth serving organizations, a set of actionable items with data and survey results to back it up. We use documented best practices in oftentimes throughout the report and recommend those as a place to start. Uh, and we've designed initiatives that will really open pathways for minorities, women, uh, underserved, underrepresented groups who have so much to gain and so much to give to this industry. Next slide. So this is one of the big, the big overarching recommendations, and I called it the connective tissue because I think it's what makes these recommendations work in the long term, um, and what we think will work in the long term. And it's a model for how educators, industry, government, and other stakeholders can continue to work together long after the report is done and to drive each other's shared purpose, common action, um, and really work hard for, for students and their families. So we're suggesting regional advisory councils based on the FAA's nine regions. These would be composed of major stakeholders so aviation museums, youth serving organizations, some in aviation, some not, right? We know, you know, boys and girls clubs, urban leagues, right? If we make them part of the conversation, they can actually help us solve this problem. You know, high schools, training providers that would meet together to design best pathways, to decide what should work and will work in their region, and also share that information and provide a connected pathway for those students. And then we're suggesting that the chairs from the regional advisory councils report up to a national advisory council that would look to monitor these efforts, to disseminate best practices, to design metrics for success and monitor the implementation and really drive continuous improvement. We don't want it to stop with us. Next slide. Okay, so let's get into the recommendations. So that first bucket that I talked about urgently needed early awareness. So one of the statistics that came from our own survey work was 72% of teachers with little to no knowledge of available aviation and aerospace resources. So all of these recommendations that I'm going to talk about in this first bucket are really about how do we do that. So how do we build awareness through education, new platforms, and industry support? We have to stop being a mystery. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a mysteries can be nice, but they don't work in the long run. Right. Uh, we don't want the only way to be. I think it's a pilot or a flight attendant. And that's the only jobs I know. All right. So the first one uh, is to fund libraries to provide aviation and aerospace books and media. So I think it was a really good reminder during the pandemic about the role that libraries play, play, especially, particularly in underserved and rural communities. They are the heart of neighborhoods. And for minority communities, they are also a safe haven. There's research that's been done about how safe uh, minority communities feel in public libraries because there are places for resources and where they can be themselves. So we're really suggesting that there be resources at the elementary, middle, and high school level in public libraries uh, that really speak to aviation and aerospace careers. So allocate city state funding to select books and media and use those, and I'm gonna, you're gonna hear this a lot, the regional advisory councils to help drive what happens in those libraries or help drive those as additional places for speakers or things like that because these are great community hubs. Next slide. 
Okay, second recommendation is to provide in-person engagement whenever possible. Um, develop written materials on aviation and aerospace for school staff and members. Um, so the survey results that I talked about in terms of 72%, and I repeated that on this slide about the basic to know knowledge, really asked for you know, things they could hand out and also having somebody come and speak, right? Those were really important. So you heard the administrator talk a little bit about the FAA's adopt a classroom. We're really suggesting that we make that program as expansive as possible. Uh, it doesn't have to just be the FAA, it could be others as well. That whole idea of bringing aviation professionals to the classroom is really important in terms of students understanding what, what a day in the life, what the career pathway is. Um, list of speakers, um, encourage the ad set office also to develop a standardized curriculum that could be used by aviation and aerospace. Uh, it could be used to promote aviation and aerospace in the classroom and incentivize young people. Uh, there's already some curriculums that exist, but it would be helpful if the uh, ad set office could also help in that effort. I'm not going to read every one. Uh, develop a list of best practices, a toolkit. This comes back to our website, which I'll get to in a few minutes, on how to engage youth, um, invite youth to industry conferences. You know, if Joe, if MBAA is um, is in a particular town, maybe we invite the Urban League to, to the conference, or we invite Boys and Girls Clubs, or we invite scouting. Um, think about in, thinking about non-traditional groups that don't we don't necessarily think at the forefront of, of aviation and aerospace implementation, but certainly having those groups attend those uh, conferences would be terrific. The other one that's interesting is considering using the 4-H model. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we're, we're trying to show in the report best practices, particularly uh, those that are done by other industries and groups and sectors that have solved some of their workforce issues. The agriculture industry has struggled with how do we inspire the next generation of farmers. Uh, and the 4-H has a model which involves the farming community and about 100 public colleges across the country who engage with students starting at age eight. So could be something there that we might be able to model and copy, uh, particularly with outreach to a younger age um, and partner with professional organizations uh, for women and minorities, uh, including places like the Organization for Black Aerospace Professionals, Society for Women Engineers, uh, which has aerospace engineers as part of it, groups like that. Next slide. Third recommendation is about developing um, turnkey after school aviation and aerospace activities. So we know we have about 10 million students across the country that are involved in after school activities, but 25 million are waiting for a program. So clearly, this is a space that we can have great impact. And we already have a wonderful model in the FAA's Aviation Career Education Academy, uh, which does mostly in the summer, uh, grades K through 12, typically partnership between uh, industry and, and institutions uh, who work together to provide really great curriculum and hands-on opportunities. Uh, number four, launch early outreach to future teachers and guidance counselors. So this idea of Teachers are our first opportunity, right? They are on the front lines every day talking to exactly the students that we want, right? So making sure that they are well equipped with all the tools and resources that they need and to do that before they even get to the classroom, right? So making sure they have information in graduate schools of education, um, regardless of their specialty. So whether you're teaching history or you're teaching math or you're teaching science, you know a little bit about how aviation can be applied to your curriculum. Uh, we can work together to provide information that infuses their curriculum. And then this is this is a neat one. There's a Albert Einstein Teachers Fellow Teaching Fellows Program, and it's set it's designed for teachers to be part of uh, government agencies for 11 months. As far as we can tell, the FAA and DOT are not involved yet. So this would be a great opportunity to bring teachers into the FAA, into the, into the Department of Transportation, and provide them with basically a, a year-long engagement. And then they can take that information back to their districts. So in a lot of cases, we mean we're not going to invent the next greatest project. They all exist. It's about putting them in one place and utilizing them and sharing those resources in a really good way. Next slide. 
empower teachers to ignite student interest. So as I said, right, this, this idea of teachers are, are really at the forefront of, of helping us with this issue. So we can use them to um, train the trainer, right? I know that we have teachers here, teachers here. So sorry, with my glasses on, I can't see where you are. You know, who are inspiring other teachers in their, not only in their buildings, but I'm sure in their in their districts, right? Um, use established curriculum, use teaching academies and camps. Civil Air Patrol has hands-on kits that can be used in classrooms. Uh, coordinate with aviation museums. We found as a, a direct result of our research that aviation museums are already doing a lot of this work in their communities. So how can we work together to support them and coordinate with them? Uh, providing teachers with incentives. They're like everybody else. It helps to have an incentive, right? So making sure they get continuing education units and possible funding uh, to really support them in their in their effort to, to bring our, our field to their classroom. And use the regional advisory councils again, specifically to coordinate and collaborate maximum impact, right? Make sure that the aviation museum is in the same room as the, the school district so that they know when major events come up during the year. You know, let's do Amelia Earhart Day. Let's do National Maintenance, Aviation Maintenance Day. You know, let's let's coordinate on these activities so that, so that we're not working in silos. Um, and then just a little tip for the ABSET office, uh, you know, maybe consider having a booth at the American School Counselor Association. Um, more passive, but if we had materials there in terms of curriculum, and at least uh, they know where the resources are when they're when they're thinking about how do they infuse that in the classroom. Next slide. So how do we build awareness through new platforms? Uh, so young people, I don't think anybody's gonna be surprised by this statistic. Young people ages eight to 18 spend an average of six hours a day consuming, I think that's all of us too, consuming digital media, gaming, and time in front of screens. 80% uh, of middle school teachers in our research and counselors said that developing social media and digital collateral would help us create greater awareness. And additionally, 71%, this is a nationwide statistic, under the age of 18 play video games, and they are nearly as likely to be girls, which I thought was a bit of a surprise for some. Um, clearly, this is a space that provides us with excellent opportunities for awareness building, right? So we are suggesting specifically social media, gaming, virtual reality, augmented reality, platforms like metaverse can really open pathways uh, to really change students' minds about what they might perceive uh, in terms of technology. And really we can reach the next generation. So you're already starting to see the, AV, uh, the FAA do this. They have brand, some brand ambassadors uh, and some outreach efforts, particularly they've done a great job in the last two years in social media uh, in trying to reach young people. We actually suggest that you keep young people engaged in the process. So I think as part of the regional advisory councils, we should have groups of young people. And I think after about age 24 year old. So right, it's gotta be a constant group of, you know, middle school, high school students that they could put on their resumes, right? This could be a great opportunity to always keep us engaged in what's the next best platform to be thinking about, right? Should we be on TikTok? How funny should it be, right? These kind of things. Should we set something to the corn song, right? Uh, for those of you that know what the corn song issue is, um, we just did one. Um, it's very funny. So, what are all the ways that we can think about engaging young people? How do we use celebrities, prominent influencers, and please, they have got to be people of color, Black, Indigenous, uh, people of color, women. You have to see it to be it. So, every opportunity we get, we have to use people that students are inspired by. Uh, the Ad Council, can we run an Ad Council campaign? So they just did, this is a, a nonprofit organization that does uh, free ad campaigns across the country. They just did one for girls in STEM. How cool would it be to do one about aviation and aerospace? The, I thought this was a brilliant idea because you're captive and you can't go anywhere. How about, Airlines creating short videos for the back of those entertainment centers, right? Showcase all the different careers. Talk about your own airline and the things that you're doing in terms of pathway programs, how much you invest in aviation and aerospace education providers. I mean, that's just a great opportunity. And show people of color 
in positions that are meaningful and have transformed their lives uh, and develop partnerships with the gaming industry to develop digital collateral. Next slide. The last uh, major section in building uh, early awareness is through industry support. So we know, I have seen this uh, in my own institution, how much of a difference competition can make for students. It's actually the lead indicator in the literature for student success is participating in some type of student competition. It's a great way to engage young people. Um, we're already seeing this work with robotics across the country. I won't name the organizations, you know who I'm talking about. Um, we believe the same can be done with younger students, with fixed wing, uncrewed aerial systems, uh, industry sponsorship of these and other types of competitions, hackathons where you bring students together in 24 hours, right? They sleep in the museum and they solve a problem. Uh, these are all places that can really drive awareness and excitement, excitement about the industry. And the National and Regional Advisory Councils, again, be a great source to develop competitions in your region tied to your industry and what the industry needs. Next slide. Okay, so we're moving on to our next major bucket, uh, and that is information access is essential. The internet is the answer. Over and over and over again, we came back to this as a group about needing one place that delivered all of the information that we need. We know there's great information out there, but if you don't Google it right, <laughs> you don't get what you need. And sometimes you don't know how to Google a thing you don't know anything about, right? So we need a central source for information. Uh, we know that awareness is one of the greatest barriers to entry and not having one place to find information is hurting us in a major way. Um, we not only want the site to be a bulletin board though, it can't just be a place where we post stuff. It has to be vibrant, dynamic, I think it should have the input of the regional advisory councils in terms of driving content, particularly for a region. Uh, and it really has to be something that people view as a one-stop shop and their first resource. Uh, and it will change the conversation from a family member or a friend told me about aviation to, I learned about it, I found out about it, I went to the website, right? Next slide. Okay, so what are the essential elements for this aerospace aviation information portal? We suggest creating messages, particularly for some major groups, which include students, parents, caregivers, and educators. And when I say educators, I mean guidance counselors and teachers, uh, providing connections to regional uh, activities. So whether it's your local Civil Air Patrol unit or it's an aviation museum, or it's an OBAP chapter or whatever it is, that it's all in one place and you know how to find it. Access to curriculum, infographics, videos, day in the life, um, career pathways, salaries, how do I afford it? What does the funding look like? All of these things help parents, families, students, educators to understand what our industry is about and to take away the mystery. We also suggest there's some great new tools out there in terms of a virtual counselor. And by virtual, I mean, it's not a person, right? There is artificial intelligence, chatbots that will scrape the site and be able to answer questions, uh, you know, for anybody that's looking for anything. But we also suggest if there, if it's ever possible to have some part of the site staffed at some point, maybe it's Monday through Friday or Saturday, or at least an email box that is staffed and somebody answers it. <laughs> we can't do it. We can't do anything else. At least a live body can get back to you in email. Uh, so we know this is a major un undertaking. Uh, you know, it's a it's a big it's a big hairy idea that requires uh, lots of planning and thought and resources. Uh, in the report, we did not um, say it should be run by this person or it should be run by that person, but rather suggested a couple of options uh, and maybe some ways to get this up and running um, in a pretty in pretty short order. There are already great videos, information out there on the web that you could kind of borrow and use to create a one-stop shop. Next slide. 
Um, so the next major bucket that we're gonna talk about is uh, collaboration. I've already talked about this a little bit in terms, especially in terms of the regional councils, uh, but I can't emphasize enough this idea that we are very siloed. So we have great uh, organizations, opportunities, things going on within cities that the other one doesn't know what the other one is doing. It happens all the time in New York. <laughs> <laughs> right. I will look, we're all doing something for Girls in Aviation Day. What if we all did it together, <laughs> right? Uh, so this idea of collaborating and using our mutual resources for the good of all, uh, we think is really untapped potential. So creating the regional advisory councils again comes up here, you know, championing the best efforts. Um, and you could use the same structure as you used to establish this group for the women's board. And again, this is just a suggestion, you know, that could be that the ABSED regional coordinator is the person who helps bring those people together. We're not saying do all the work, but be the, the person who is the, the collaborator. Next slide. So this is another area which I think is really exciting and has lots of potential. So career and college readiness platforms, they are powerful tools. They're used by almost all high school students across the country. When my kids were in high school, it was mandatory. We had to go for training as parents to look at these systems. And so they offer us a great opportunity to reach young people and their families uh, to prepare them for a career. It offers um, a sense of pathway where you can go for that particular skill set or education. And we think it could be a really powerful and impactful tool. So some of the names, Naviance, Career Zone, Career Connect, Zello. Uh, we are suggesting that the aviation uh, FAA's AFSET office could reach out to these career platforms uh, to determine what information they are currently using. Uh, it's fairly disjointed. Again, if you don't know what you're looking for, you don't know how to search for it. So if you don't, if you only put in aviation, <clears throat> I think it comes up with some very, you know, siloed kind of, you know, like pilots, right? It doesn't, the systems don't understand how vast aviation is. And so it needs um, some input in terms of good information. <clears throat> we are also suggesting a collaboration between the FAA and DOT and the Department of Education um, in terms of having some really good free flow of information, particularly around economic data, which we think can help inform families about the really rich opportunities that are available <clears throat> for students. Next slide. So this one's packed, I'm sorry for the size on the screen. Um, so significantly increase mentoring, pre-apprenticeships and apprenticeships available to grow future employees. So the idea of reaching students at a younger age and getting them on the path through mentoring, pre-apprenticeships, which is really just career exposure and apprenticeships by collaborating with existing national and government programs <clears throat> is really a tremendous opportunity. This is all about, <clears throat> sorry, about creating awareness and incentives with credit bearing and or hands-on experience to drive the expansion of the talent pool. Job Corps at very first bullet is a great example of this. This is a nationally federally funded program that links education, academic and career skills training. They currently serve about 40,000 students um, and many go on to apprenticeships and the retention rate for apprenticeships is incredible, about 92%. We also suggest a significant increase in aviation industry apprenticeships programs. The retention or the, the uptake on these has been slow because of you have to be able to be certified to touch something, right? So um, can we partner with schools, colleges, training providers for greater access and opportunities? The ch and I'll talk about this again later. The new change, which just happened yesterday uh, to the part 147 program right, could offer new opportunities for stackable credentials that might allow for a greater opportunity for apprenticeships. So, you know, how can we think about that, particularly in terms of the new rules? Um, there are several other national organizations that provide high quality skill certification, um, including, and this is again tied back to the 147, part 147 change, the National Coalition of Certification Centers, NC3, Nonprofit uh, builds industry educational partnerships and develops and implements and sustains industry recognized credentials. So they're portable 
um, could we tie this into a repairment certificate, right? Um, I think the part 147, it's just begun, right? In terms of what we, how we can think about this really helping students uh, long-term and getting more uh, students into the industry. Uh, so consider best practices in developing mentoring programs. We give some suggestions about that in the report. Uh, develop career coaching, right? Uh, a very high impact practice that when coupled with mentoring and hands-on can really help drive uh, success, particularly for underrepresented populations. And then again, I say at the end, you know, this idea of creating stackable credentials as part of the 147 program um, is, I think, could be tremendous. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, next recommendation, build educational outreach to underrepresented groups. So this one's near and dear to my heart because I serve in a minority serving institution. We are, they are an untapped resource for students and families. We already do a tremendous amount of this work. Um, our, our students and their families want well-defined career pathways with very clear return on investments. It is all about the value of the proposition. Uh, and so we think by working particularly with these institutions, um, this is a great opportunity. So engaging with them um, and to your colleges, which also include uh, a large number of minority serving institutions to talk specifically about the market driven opportunities that are available to their students, uh, drive recruitment with these groups. Please, as was said to us by one of the student groups that we talked to, stop going to predominantly white institutions and expecting a diverse population to show up. You have to go where they are. And that means going to minority serving institutions. This was a great idea and came from one of our FAA folks is to partner with university minority sororities and fraternities. They are already doing this work in their communities with high school students. So why not partner with them to make sure that the word is getting out, right? Uh, and uh, leveraging opportunities with the regional advisory councils to think about inroads into underrepresented communities. I talked a little bit that whether it's scouting or whether it's boys and girls clubs or uh, places where um, you can really find uh, underrepresented groups. So another huge part of this is dual enrollment programs, which over the last several years, we have seen grow in size and importance, particularly for families that want to see the return on investment earlier, right? They wanna know that that particular credential or that particular degree has meaning in the marketplace, right? So. Um, starting young, you're using high school courses um, that are often taught at the college level and count for both, which is wonderful. Um, I'll give you a good example. We cited in the report a uh, Hispanic serving institution that works with an underrepresented school district to provide uh, the first year of college throughout three years of high school, and then they need one more year of college to achieve an associate's degree in avionics and then they go to work for a local provider, right? So it is very much about the high school, the college and the industry piece being very clear to students and their families. It's also a great way to save money for families because they typically don't pay for the college course while they're in high school. Uh, so employers should seek out higher education and technical institutions and work with them uh, to see what they can do, particularly with Title I schools that they may serve in those areas. Title I high school, for folks who don't know, um, are where there's a high degree of free lunch, typically where the students with low, from some low socioeconomic backgrounds are. Um, and it significantly expand the grant funding available to the FAA to drive innovation. So we've seen this wonderful, we're about to have the second round out of innovation Part, it's really about driving innovation and partnerships between high schools, colleges, and universities and industry. Uh, we just think it should be about five times more money. Um, so I, the original program was 10 million. We really believe it should be 50 million. We also make the recommendation in the report that the FAA should receive operational funds because we know it was an incredibly heavy lift. Um, to put that entire program in place. And if we really want to benefit from it and we want the FAA to share the best practices and the learnings that we get from these partnerships, then you absolutely need the operational funds and the staffing in order to do that. Next slide. Okay, heading into the probably the hardest uh, aspect of all this is how do we fund it? Right, we have all these wonderful, amazing ideas. Um, how do we fund this? So, 
overcoming the financial hurdles supporting individuals and organizations. So we know that education and training costs present a significant burden, right? I talked about the other one, which is awareness. Awareness and finances, the two greatest burdens to underrepresented groups to join our industry. Um, and these, the finances in particular for underrepresented and folks from low socioeconomic backgrounds is a tremendous hurdle. Um, and we don't even know how many students we lose who decide too expensive not for making, right? Uh, so we offer some individual, some suggestions for how to help individual students. You know, can we look at decreasing the cost of flight training by increasing the allowable simulator time? So simulator time is roughly half, slightly less than half the cost of a flight training hour. And we know that it takes students roughly 60 to 80 hours to achieve a private pilot license. You have to have a minimum of 40. So they're clearly training much more in the cockpit. Is there a way to reduce the number of flight training hours by using simulators to help drive competency, right? So we're not suggesting we change the minimums. We're not suggesting we change the standards. This is not in any way tied to changing safety standards. We wanna keep those safety standards high. What we are suggesting is that there is a way to use simulators to drive down the cost of a private pilot license. Uh, and it also can help with the instrument, even more so with the instrument, to be honest. Uh, and how can we think about simulator time in terms of really helping students to achieve what they need to be successful in the flight deck, but at the same time, spend less money. Uh, another, and so in terms of proposed implementation, we're making the suggestion that the FAA work with existing flight training device manufacturers to see what the optimal mix might be. Right? Maybe we try with a small pilot 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 program to see what will work in terms of uh, really making sure that the mix is correct. <laughs> pilot pilot pilot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Another another tremendous one is to increase the maximum Pell Grant for students. So so appreciative. Uh, President Biden has really put effort behind doubling Pell which would be significant by 2030. Unfortunately, even if he serves a second term, he won't be here in 2030. <laughs> so, and we need this to happen much sooner. Uh, you know, this has been a, very much a national conversation as well. And I'll talk a little bit in a second about debt relief, uh, but we really think providing students with uh, what would roughly be 13 to $14,000 a year, as opposed to the roughly six or 7,000 it is right now, uh, would be a tremendous way to help with the costs. Now, Pell's gone up about $400 this year. The president has proposed as part of his budget for this coming year, a $2,000 uh, increase. The, those are tremendous moves, um, but doubling Pell would be game changing. So we're suggesting Congress continue increasing Pell grants as soon as possible. And that there's, you know, is there a possibility for an MOU between the FAA, the Department of Transportation, and the Department of Education, who administers Pell Grants, to look at the structure about how we respond to national crises for particular industries, right? We're not the only industry that deals with this. Healthcare is another place. And are there ways that we could provide greater flexibility in funding for particular industries that are dealing with crises? Next slide. Okay. Develop a national aviation scholarship program. Uh, so this one we know is probably the hardest <laughs> in terms of where we're going to find the funding for this. So we made lots of suggestions. We think, you know, if one of these doesn't work, maybe two of these will work. We recognize that many of them are tied to laws that have to be changed, but we, we, we offer these in the hope that the conversation keeps going. Right, so add funding to the US Department of Education budget specifically to support aerospace and aviation. I've suggested Pell, if we were to do a national aviation scholarship program, maybe this is the way. Establish a separate fund or redirect funds within the airport and airway trust fund that could be devoted particularly to a national aviation scholarship. Again, those funds are are really tied to airports, right? The law says you can't take that money off airport. So this would definitely require a law change. However, you know, how, how impactful could it be to use 
you know, a very small portion of that money to benefit all of aviation, airlines, airports, manufacturers, uh, repair stations, you know, everybody would benefit from, from that funding. We could establish a 10% user fee on all commercial airline tickets sold in the U.S. Again, we understand very hard, controversial, uh, but we're trying to show you that it's these little sure, small moves. Ten yes. cents. Oh, did I? What did I say? Ten percent. Oh, ten cents. Thank you. Yes, ten cents. <laughs> yes, ten cents on every uh, on every airline ticket sold. Thank you, Brett. Uh, you know, very small. Uh, but very controversial. We understand that. Uh, but we're trying to show you that some of these incremental moves can have a tremendous impact. Another way is to consider increasing landing fees, right? Use those for the scholarship fund. Uh, and, you know, only for aviation, only for aviation. The other option is we, I talked a few minutes ago about increasing the uh, funding given to the FAA for these wonderful, innovative, collaborative programs from 10 million to 50 million. Could we look at, because it's coming from general funds, you know, moving that from 50 to 100 million and 50 million of that is set aside for an aviation scholarship program. Again, that would be complicated. We understand that, uh, you know, if there's an MOU between FAA, DOT and DOE, could you work together to figure out how to administer those funds? Uh, these are all ideas that we think could help solve the problem, especially for individuals. Okay, one of the other major areas that we uncovered as a result of our, and some of us knew this already, but in terms of talking about it at a national level was youth serving organizations, aviation and uh, educational providers, both training and, and higher education, spend a lot of their time chasing funding, right? and not serving the students who we were trying to get onto that great job, that great career, that transformative life. And so what we, what we would like to see happen is a consistent, reliable funding stream for those, uh, for those organizations set around standards, right? We're not just giving money away, we are setting standards. And it also allows us to put in place uh, opportunities for greater tracking, asking for measurable outcomes, being able to report out on those measurable outcomes. So it gives us an opportunity to, to create the infrastructure for long-term success. Uh, and so uh, the specifics are in the report, but also here, uh, we would use this as um, a, a grant program that would be paid for using a quarter of a percent of Department of Defense and Department of Transportation contracts. Uh, it will require companies to address the workforce need in their region when submitting uh, for that particular contract with the federal government. Uh, and it will allow to allow those uh, companies to use aerospace educators as subcontractors on that grant. And they would have to pull those organizations from a defined list. And we give details in the report about how that list would be generated. Uh, the subcontracts would focus with those organizations would focus on building the workforce um, and to strip and absolutely demonstrating, like I said, those trackable outcomes. So how are they getting students into those those really great um, careers? Congress would need to pass the legislation in order to make this happen. Uh, but we think this could be a great long term sustainable way with just a small, small percentage of uh, of of funding set aside for this particular effort. Next slide. Uh, another one that requires congressional action, but we think um, could be a great incentive is to increase the uh, tax incentive for companies uh, who donate to aerospace education programs, both in terms of their, uh, not only in terms of direct funding, but also volunteer time, equipment. This is especially important for maintenance uh, training institutes, uh, engines are not cheap. <laughs> uh, and so uh, being able to give more credit to the organization that gives you that particular piece of equipment would be tremendous. Um, it could really increase corporate engagement. And then another a side note about this one is we also think that uh, just in general, if companies could please on their websites, list resources for youth serving organizations, educational institutions. You know, if you want an engine, if you need a speaker, um, if you're interested in a tour, 
right? Some place that we can go so that we don't have to hope we know the right person to get to the right place. Um, and this could all be an incentive um, to help support that effort. Next slide. Okay, so um, this one again, uh, thinking a little bit outside the box, at the national level, certainly in the last few weeks with the president's announcement of the debt relief that's being offered, uh, really congratulate that effort, particularly the monies for uh, the additional funding for Pell Grant recipients. Um, the number of low income underrepresented students that that will assist is, is just tremendous. So we think there's some other ways that particularly industry here can help uh, to assist students with repaying their student and training loans. And we looked right at healthcare, who have already had to tackle this issue um, in terms of, and we outlined it in the report about a possible model that could be used, you know, when someone joins your organization, how you can assist them. Not only will it help you attract them, it will definitely help you retain them. <laughs> um, Companies could also consider while students are still in school, because we know this uh, you know, between uh, college training costs and living, um, things can get very difficult, especially right now, given inflation, students you know, need to pay the rent and the gas and keep the lights on in their homes. Could industry consider uh, a stipend to those students to cover the things that are not covered by federal and state funding to help them sort of a living stipend of, you know, how can we support students to cover the gas and the tolls and those kinds of things to really keep them on, on track. Because I can tell you at minority serving institutions, probably the biggest area that, that gets students off track is finances. Got to take a semester off, need to earn some money. I can't tell you how many students pay their bill before they start class. Um, it's tremendous. And they've worked all summer to pay off their bill to get into the next semester. So being able to provide that kind of funding for students is tremendous. Um, and work you know, with minority serving institutions to identify students at targeted high schools that we can start to, to talk to about. Here's some incentive, here's some ideas, right? You know, Even if you do um, have to take out a loan, there's gonna be help on the other side. And then our last recommendation, and I only realized yesterday we have 21 task force members. We ended up with 21 recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, the last one is really uh, to our good friends at the FAA about how they can possibly play a role in reducing costs by regularly reviewing regulations, certification standards, um, and leveraging that effort to create entry level opportunities into industry. You know, um, the part 147 is really the best example of this um, and it's the most significant change we've seen in decades. And we all believe this is gonna lead to greater skill development and adaptability as training institutions and industry can now work closely together to prepare students for an aviation maintenance career. Um, we believe all training and certification deserves this level of review and oversight on a more consistent basis so that we can be innovative and responsive together. So after we've done this amazing job of getting them at 10 and they join several organizations and they get into high school and they're in a dual enrollment program and they go to training or higher education and, um, and then they head off to that great maintenance job or dispatch job or airport manager job or pilot, um, how do we make sure they stay with us? And this is really about what happens when they get to those work environments. And we have to create inclusive work environments. Right, the whole conversation over the last two years across the country has been around this idea of creating diverse, equitable, and inclusive work environments. And I worry that as uh, as the economy change changes, we're going to start to see folks back off that agenda, and we're already starting to see it. And uh, this committee, this task force, is recommending that that not happen. That we keep, if we're going to solve this talent shortage, that we keep minorities, underrepresented populations at the forefront of our thinking and our outreach. So industry needs to be committed to diverse outreach and hiring, create equitable environments where people and individuals feel in psychologically safe and valued as members of the team, having courageous conversations in your companies about what it means to, do, to be diverse uh, and inclusive, look at 
the policies of your company with an educated lens. You know, are you using good language? Are we making sure that folks from the LGBTQ plus communities feel welcome and it's reflected in our policies? Um, are we, you know, looking at things like salary requests and it with an equitable lens? And are we providing ongoing training and education that allows everyone to learn, make mistakes, we all do, I do, and move forward? Uh, and how that change is going to happen is by setting measurable goals, publishing our data. We're already starting to see some some edu uh, some aerospace companies do this at the front end, which we think is tremendous. More need to do it. Sharing our learnings that's really important, and never, never, never stopping the work. Next slide. So. As you can probably imagine, uh, the single most important recommendation we can make after more than two years of work is that we have to keep talking. <laughs> Action and talking, but talking for sure. Uh, the regional advisory councils, the national advisory council, to bring together stakeholders on a regular basis to connect resources, imbue passion, you know, make sure we know what the others are doing, and to really work together. Um, is going to assist us in future collaboration, allow us to really make continuous improvement over the long term and solve our problem. <laughs> All right, next slide. Okay, so this is just a happy recap of each of the major buckets. So early awareness and engagement, recommendations one through seven, information access, our big one-stop shop information portal, uh, recommendations eight and nine, collaboration, uh, really working together in a deep and meaningful way uh, is recommendations 10 through 14, and then addressing the financial hurdle. Uh, you love the little guy going over the hurdle. Uh, or, or gal, or gal, uh, is recommendations 15 through 21. So there is no one solution and any of those 21 that's gonna solve this, right? This has got to be a multi-solution approach. Uh, some of these can happen more quickly and are easy. <laughs> and some of them are hard <laughs> and are gonna take effort and, and long-term commitment in order to have a greater impact. Uh, but ultimately we will make a difference as long as we collaborate, we communicate our wins, our challenges, and our commitment to attracting young people, particularly those from underrepresented backgrounds, into this exciting, impactful, transformative career path uh, will, will, be, will be achieved. So thank you. Thank you, everybody. Great job. Great. <laughs> 10 minutes. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. <clears throat> I needed a break for sure. <laughs> Some sugar definitely helps. Uh, so yeah, this uh, it's, there's a lot there in the report. Um, really, I hope act actionable, hopeful, uh, really speaking to underrepresented populations. This is the, the part of the meeting where <clears throat> uh, committee members are asked to, um, you know, we're going to have an open discussion about the report. So floor is open to anything anybody wants to talk about in terms of a specific recommendation. Um, well, Sharon, I'll start. Yeah. I think that I would like to thank you again for the hard work of putting this together because I know it was not easy. There was a lot of stuff that we threw at you and uh, you put it together in an intelligible format. So thank you very much, you and your team for doing that. It's greatly appreciated by me and I think by everybody here. Oh, oh you gave me good yeah. stuff. Thanks, so. <laughs> Ralph. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so Sharon, uh, again, thank you. Uh, incredible work. Um, one of the things that came up several times in the conversation was um, these regional based groups. Right. Um, and uh, that sounds like something that we could walk away saying, well, what a great idea that was and never happened or, <laughs> or, or go take action um, uh, right. with the running jumping person. You know, right. kind of How do you recommend that take place? What, what's the thought there? So I started this mm -hmm. already in my hometown. So the, uh, 
the new uh, person from the Eastern Regional District, uh, which is based in Jamaica, which is also in Queens. Um, and I talked and we're actually helping to coordinate around a girls in aviation day at the end of October. And so I said, well, I'll tell you everybody I know and you tell me everybody you know, and what do you think about doing something in November that puts all of us in a room together? Yeah. So my suggestion is reach out, if you don't mind Chris me saying this, reach out to your local FAA region yeah. and ask for the person who's, all the all the regions are staffed up now, right? Um, yours is not. I'm still hiring. I know, but <laughs> I wasn't going to say that out loud. But <laughs> <laughs> well, she's been great, the woman who's doing it temporarily. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got all but two. Okay. So that's a great place to start. And you may just swap lists, right? Mm -hmm. You know, just based on the work that we've done in Meyer. I knew, you know, the Cradle Aviation Museum. I knew Aviation High School. I've got airlines because they're employers. Yeah. Right. And so, so I can help that. I can help drive that in my area. Yeah, and is there like a name? Are you putting together an association? Is there a name to it? I don't know. So we give an example. Uh, came out of Yvette's group of this STEM eco ecosystems uh, link, where they're doing this on STEM activities in regions, and so you know some of them were had done more work than others, but that's the model that we're using. Uh, so you might take a look particularly around that that as a model. Um, I don't know. I think each group is going to have its own sort of flavor and yeah. feeling. I guess it depends, you know, if as a result of this, the FAA says, yes, we're going to be the ones who set up, the, I don't say you have to, we'll be the ones who set up these. So they'll be called this, right? Yeah. But if yeah. but if we started organically, yeah. which I'm going to try to do in my region, yeah. um, I don't know what we'll call them. I'll probably use the name just to try to see if it can't be a model for, for other places. I mean, we're fortunate in New York City is that we have a really great, but even we don't talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Like I said, we're two different events for Girls in Aviation Day in Queens, one at one airport, one at the other airport. We should have probably put those together, but nobody knew that anybody was doing that. Right. So those kinds of things. Yeah. Don't tell you tell your point. I, I, and you just mentioned it. I think a lot of them have started organically um, in Chicago, and you you guys have met a lot of the folks that we have in Illinois and in the Midwest region that we work with. But in 2017, uh, I started the State of Aviation Roundtable, and it's called SOAR, S O A R. I didn't know that it was going to be SOAR. It's a perfect know, word. Uh, but the State of Aviation Roundtable, Illinois, is now looking to do State of Aviation Roundtables also in Atlanta and a couple other places where we have partnerships that are burgeoning and are also looking to bring uh, these organizations together. The state of Kentucky has their own call every month. I'm on that call uh, where all of the aviation resources in the state are coming together. Um, and so it very well could happen organically, but I think to the point of it not getting lost in the sauce, if you will, having an overseer or overseeing organization or somebody that's really going to champion that region, that organically fell on my head, you know, in Chicago and in the Midwest and Northwest Indiana. But there are other places and initiatives, especially coming up around like those big major events, Girls in Aviation Day, uh, International Aviation Day, uh, National Aviation Day, which is August 19th. Uh, so being able to bring these groups together uh, and some of the big conferences um, in the big aviation organizations, maybe like AAAE and AOPA and EAA uh, can help those, those in those regional offices be able to provide at least source in some of those lists, right? In those corporations and those uh, really active um, partners uh, in the industry uh, in different pockets of the country. Would it be nice for one person to hold the list, right? Because otherwise, you're going to lose it over time. That's why it would be nice if it was the FAA regional. Office. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Because well, then you get into the you get into pilots and mechanics yeah. and auxiliary careers and STEMs and aerospace and space, and it's uh, it really has to be big enough to uh, to to have an all C and I over you know everything that's happened in aviation and space related. Well, and I think where where that structure comes in so well is that when you have the regions and then going to maybe an exec, you know, mm -hmm. a national council, right? You're getting best practices yeah. in all these different regions yeah. and you're getting regions to collaborate with one another also. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where I think yeah. that, that really, you know, really sets up, you know, the right structure. <laughs> you know, one of the things I thought of, you know, the whole time is is the timing of this report and, and the women in aviation uh, task force report. 
lends itself to the 2023 reauthorization. And the best way to ensure that it doesn't die is to make sure that a handful of these, you know, overlapping big, big recommendations, I think, can find their way. I mean, there's obviously to Brett at, at the break, Brett and I were talking a, a little bit about, you know, just how the 2018 reauthorization of Section 625 has made, you know, Chris and, 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 and the FAA just laser focused in helping the industry, um, you know, so much. I, I, I just think that this is something that, that we, as, as collectively as an industry, need to get behind. And, you know, when I look at AIA and ARSA and ATEC and the recommendations they've already made to Senate Commerce, to House T&I, um, some of those recommendations are in fact in these reports already because I think there are plenty of people that have an idea of what needs to happen. But I think there are other things that we, we really need to get, you know, focused in on because I think one of the things that you said, Sharon, I think you, you said it so well, um, is that the things that we're doing, we're doing for the good of all, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, one of the things at AR, I really, I've always stayed focused on is, I don't care where you go, I want you to come to AR, right? I really want you to come to work for us. But if it's not us, just go to somewhere in aviation, I don't even care, right? right? And I think the more that we as an industry, you know, continue to work together and, and come alongside our educational partners and our regulatory agencies, we're gonna be successful. Right. These recommendations out of both reports have huge, huge ramifications in a positive way for the entire industry. And I think as long as we stay out of those silos, like you're <laughs> also talking about, hey, I, I do this over here, but I really don't want to tell you. Right. Yeah. That, that doesn't do us any good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So great job. Yeah. So with that, I like to exactly say that as an educator, we welcome the industry. We really do. We want you in there as partners when it comes to being a guest speaker. We want you there for career fairs. We definitely want the industry there when it comes to college recruitment and college fairs. And we would love to have funding for simulators. I personally believe that simulators should be in uh, every school. Uh, so we look forward to uh, continuing the partnership. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. So we appreciated having your voice in the process, right? I mean, it's not often that you get, you know, somebody from the middle school environment. God bless you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't imagine working with that age group every day. That's a hard age to be, right? Uh, and so your voice was really important in terms of this report and, you know, the career readiness platforms, right? We, we might not have gone there if you hadn't been in the group. So thank you. Yeah. And I'd like to say on behalf of teachers, uh, something that teachers express over and over, that you know they are very interested in innovative lessons, uh, but it needs to be clear and direct and easy to implement for them. Uh, uh, always interested in innovative lessons. Yeah, to tie onto that conversation, and I heard Tamara talking about this when we were on a break about how that we all knew that the two important ages are 10 and 18, so middle school and the break in to uh, their career. But, you know, I don't know that it, it is common knowledge. For us educators, we know that it is, but I think it's good for the administration and actually people around the country to understand that the power that these middle schools have and the, when you are leading to your actual uh, vocations, that is where you will pick your jobs. And quite honestly, we need to be make sure we are focusing at that level to reach the most kids in the most timely fashion. And I think the biggest differentiation between the two magic numbers, 10 and 18, is 10 is when kids really find what they're interested in and what they love. 18 is when they make the decision on how they're going to get paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, see, right? and so that's the difference. So even though there's these two different magic ages, right, the focus for those 10 years for those 10 year olds is honing and perfecting that mastery, building their confidence, giving them the intellectual uh, tools and academic tools that they need to be successful. But then those practical applications of that knowledge between 16, 17, and 18 year old as their resume building is gonna position them for those job opportunities that they then 
qualify for and not don't get into certifications right because you have to even be old enough to get certain licensure and credentials so there's so much flight simulation you can be a glider pilot at 14 but you can't solo a single engine aircraft until you're 16 years old and you can't license until you're 17 so what are we waiting for Right. What are we waiting for when we actually can severely decrease the cost? Yeah. So by the time they get to 18, they're going right into instru commercial instrument, right. commercial. We want them to get that CFI as an add on. And we're literally accelerating those pathways. And universities are really going to have to figure out how to stay relevant uh, because the four year timeline for pilot training is is basically out the window. Uh, we can we cannot afford to wait four years for the bachelor's degree, and uh, in that magic age of eighteen, uh, we're having students hit their commercial license by twenty twenty one years old. Right. It's yeah. happening now. Yeah, yeah. The quicker we can get them to a certified flight instructor, and somebody else is paying for that seat time, mm -hmm. then you're making it right. <laughs> But a lot of them have been coached and mentored to bypass the CFI so they can get on a career pathway sooner. And it's yeah. important for students to understand what the options are right. in terms of right. jobs, because there's not one clear pathway that's, that's right. good for everybody. You know, students need to see that there are many different kinds of jobs and pathways right. so that they can pick the one that's best for them. Right. I'll use an example of like engineering. Mm -hmm. If a student wants to go into engineering and they really are attracted to that, they need to start thinking about taking the math courses that they need, yes. science courses. Right. And you can't, I remember when I was a teacher years ago, I had a student that wanted to be a physician. And then I, so I asked him, I said, I've been working in an inner city high school. And I asked the kid, I said, that's really great. And I said, what was the wonderful thing that happened to you today? So I was first in line lunch. I said, well, that's good. <laughs> there were 400 kids in the school, but that doesn't help them get to the, being a physician. Right. Uh, and so kids need to understand that there are specific things they need to do to get to a particular point where they want to be. Right. And uh, I think uh, the recommendations that we have that articulate the, uh, the pathways and the opportunities and the specific jobs that are available and the salaries right. and the salaries that they can have with those jobs. If the kids understand those pathways and how to get there, then those options are more real for them. If, uh, if the student that has never seen a pilot other than flying on an airplane, don't know what it, what, what it is or how to, what it's all about, maybe they want to be a maintenance technician. They don't even know that's a job, yeah. or they want to be an engineer. They right. is it a, is it somebody who drives a train? You know they don't yeah. know, and so they need to be able to understand what these jobs are all about, and what does it take to get to be one of those people, and how much does it pay? Right, because right. that's really Karen. Karen, this is Joe out in the Zoom world. If you can hear me, yeah. Hi, hi, every, hi, everyone. Chair, that was an excellent uh, job this morning. Thank you so much, and I love this conversation. I think what we're saying is, you know, the connectivity of how important local and regional interaction is, engagement, industry with educators, that's how we're going to hook them. That's how we get them excited. That's where we can talk to them about if this is a, an aspiration for you. Here's here's the math, for example, that you need to be focused on now so that you can ascend in your career. But then it's the perfect marriage of that delivery platform. We want them to leave these conversations, these interactions with us with an action item to go and learn more or to be able to go back and talk to their, um, their caregiver or their educator and get more information and be able to articulate why something sparked their interest. And if we don't have a place for them to go and get that really clear information on this is the career I learned about today and here using the power of the internet is the way for me to, to determine that career path. Here is a scholarship I can apply for. Here is a way I can connect with somebody uh, who could possibly a mentor for me or may be able to offer me a tour or an experience that can further personalize my journey. So, you know, I, I of course would never water down all 21 recommend recommendations, but the themes I see coming out are community, engagement, and connectivity. And if we can marry those things together, we can take the beauty of a girls in aviation day and then have them leave on a Saturday feeling so warm about what they learned. And hopefully by Sunday or Monday, they've now connected with that platform and they understand what those next steps are. So it's just, it's such important work. And I love how all of our recommendations are, are coming together to, to bloom like that. So thank you so much. Yeah, great point, Joe, thank you. And in thinking about pathways, we can turn that lens on ourselves as industry too, right? Because I mean, Tamara brings up great points about how 
pilot training and opportunities have changed and how we need to think differently, right? On maintenance, it's an even more expansive challenge because we have pathways that, you know, you may have been inspired at 10 about aviation, but maybe you're 35 and you're working somewhere else already. Well, hey, we can still make a home for you in aviation. And when we think in a uh, antiquated way, about careers that start in early life and end with retirement with a straight line between the two, yeah. that just really isn't as much of a reality for many of us anymore. You know, when we don't break out of those older ways of thinking, then we miss out on those opportunities to create pathways at every, you know, stop off the interstate. And even thinking, I mean, Ryan mentioned working with our regulators, right? Our regulators are made up of people too who have career pathways, who in many ways come out of industry or from other areas, how do we bolster those entities, the FAA, other government bodies, so that not only do they have the bodies that they need, but those bodies are equipped with minds that think expansively about the industry and its future, so that our businesses, our new entrants, our people don't but up against certain walls when they deal with their regulator that makes it harder to want to stay in the industry once you're here. I think that's an important component to this as well. You, you make such an excellent point. And I think the entire categorization of where we are as an industry, as the pilot shortage is probably a huge part of the problem. This is not a pilot shortage. It is a workforce shortage in one of the most transformative and highest paid industries in the history of American economics. That literally is the base of our commerce and the way that we do business and interact with the world. And so when you label it as the pilot shortage, you we stay singularly focused on solving the pilot problem. This is not a pilot problem. This is a workforce problem, just like the rest of America has. And the pilots, of course, always get all of the attention. <laughs> always. With the aviator shades and the leather jackets, we get it. And the movie just came out again, and we're all excited. But listen, we really have to, we have to keep the industry focused. And it's going to be, to your point, Brett, the corporate lens in telling the industry who we need. The airlines are very vocal that they need pilots. What is the industry, other in parts of the industry saying? The FAA, when they put out the BATC campaign, they were very focused on what they wanted to advertise as the job market. And I think every sector in the aviation industry is going to have to take ownership of marketing and promoting the jobs that they need. Because if they don't, the pilots are going to put on the aviator shades and the leather jackets and their flight bags, and they're going to show up and they're going to get all the jobs, and then they're going to oh, save yeah. the industry. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You can say I'm not even allowed to wear the leather jackets. I'm sorry, and I have my leather jacket and my aviator shades, so I completely understand. But but we have to take responsibility and accountability for the way that we've marketed and promoted. Mm -hmm. The industry, and it's always been pilots first and everybody else second. And we have to reframe our thinking around how we're gonna recruit the next generation because we have millions of young people out there that maybe flying was the lure, right? But it wasn't the glue. Yeah. Especially because their bank account or their parents' bank account, you know, would substantiate that. And there are huge opportunities uh, to be able to make a change, but we have to sell our industry. I sat in traffic today next to a bus with a we're hiring drivers and technicians advertisement <laughs> on the side of it. That's right. And if you could break into one of those roles, and you, you're not going to see it on a on a United aircraft flying 32,000 feet above your head. But it could be on the back of the seats. Yeah. The, the that's seat. right. That's right. Yep. That was a good suggestion. Yeah, it really was. Yeah. yeah. I was going to just mention kind of going back to the report and just for the people out there that weren't in the involved in sort of the the making of the, the document to really look at the recommendations because I think we were intentional about in some respects not directing who would implement this because it is a holistic um, approach and many of those can be done by multiple people throughout government, industry, um, educators, and, and again kind of going to Joe's point about the connectivity but 
um, some of the points that weren't part of the presentation but are in the report are the, the data and the survey results and very well sourced. And so please, I would encourage if anyone is reading the report has questions about the surveys we did and especially for the trends committee. And thank you so much to my team members. We were a really dedicated um, group and I could not have done it without you guys, but we dug in and really just tried to ensure that any of our recommendations were sourced through data and um, so I would just encourage the, the users of the report, and it should be multiple users, it's not just the FAA, um, to, to look back and, and reach out for questions. So thank you. And following on to that, I think particularly one of the things I love about our report and our recommendations is that they're really scalable. Um, not only the multiple groups can participate and, and dig into this, particularly early awareness engagement and the collaboration recommendations, very small local groups can engage on these recommendations all the way up to huge corporations and everybody in between so i really think that's um, unique about our report sometimes you know you get a this huge report with recommendations you don't even know where to start but i think we have starting spots on most all of our recommendations from multiple levels and tiers yeah so angela and and sharon where do you see now that we are former members of the committee where do you see or what is even as a committee where do we carry the torch and how much of it do we go out and begin speaking to agencies organizations you know to to allow them the information that we've worked on to be more public. Where, where do we see that? Really? So once you all officially submit the report, so today you all are discussing the report, you would take a vote, you know, in a public setting, and then Sharon will officially submit the report. Once we have that report, that's when the task force sunsets. So anything that a task force wants, wants to do once the report has been submitted, you it's free reign. Mm -hmm. You can do it as former task force members or as they purser, Sid Smith, however, you know, you all can take the lead as you all to me appear to already be doing in certain areas to try to keep the focus where it needs to be. That's where you all have a huge impact. It, it is. Mm -hmm. It's very, very large. Right? Yeah, and I would just say we uh, you're all free to disseminate. I encourage you. Oh, just yeah. please push this out in your networks. What's this? What's yeah. this? What's this? Yeah. 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 Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm into tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Uh, please, you know, put it on your LinkedIn profiles, send it to your superintendent, send it to your state education department. Um, you know, I think we're going to have to push this um, in order to make it happen. You know, my little example of trying to unite the, the New York City people together, I'm doing it myself, right? Uh, and working with partners to try to do that. You know, make a difference where you sit, right? And I think, uh, you know, you'll all get asked to speak. Some of us already have been asked, but you're going to get asked to speak on Pat. You know, volunteer to talk about this too, right? I think the more that we can talk about it and, and, and do the things that we talked about in the report and also talked about as a group, I think that's that's what's gonna give it the long-term. Well, don't, don't wait to be asked, because I've said here with yeah, all absolutely. of you are phenomenal communicators. I, I mean, I have learned as an educator myself, and Tam, all of you are amazing at speaking, so use that talent to go out there and disseminate yeah. this information. It, it's, what, it's what we're gonna need. So David, you do bring out an interesting question. I, I, I don't know the answer, so this is more towards you, Angela. Now that the once tomorrow happens, yes. <laughs> once the report is in the hands of the FAA, what, envision what what happens internally then. Just because I I don't have any idea. Good question. Good question. Glad you asked. Yeah. <laughs> so what we would do is um, FAA has to go through the report first, so it's going to be. I mean, you know, we may be, we can be a little slow sometimes. So I would say within the next couple of months, we will review the report. Once we do that, we will determine where we believe the lead officers within FAA will be the right. ones. Like, there will probably be some sent to. Yeah, just a few for Chris. Over there, you know, <laughs> and they'll go to other places within the Okay. And so, you know, the, the secretary and the deputy administrator wanted us to look at this holistically. So now that we have the women's report, 
then we, we, we will be receiving the task report soon. What we also look at first is where the crossover is. Yeah. Yeah. Because we know it's there is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't want to just get it and just boom, move out there. We want to have a strategy, you know, on the approach that we take. Yeah. As you said earlier, Ryan, we believe that with we all coming up for FAA, you know, this is a perfect time where some of these recommendations could very easily or some yeah. ideals of them because that's where this came from. On reauth back in 2018. And so it's gonna take it's gonna go to take a couple of months for us to read through it, figure out what the who the who we believe the appropriate officers are within FAA that would take the lead because it's not the officer we yeah. We were the ones that managed this process. Man kind of goes, you know, we would track it to make sure recommendations are being worked, but we won't be the lead officers to carry out those recommendations. Angela, I have a question about that. Will y'all share this with the Department of Education? Will oh, yes. We can. Along mm -hmm. to them? Mm -hmm. And DOL. We well. make quite a few recommendations around Department of Labor as well. I mean, yeah. it will be posted on the FAA community website. I know that we, different offices within FAA have contacts at DOL and at, you know, the Department of Education. And so through those, con you know, contact vehicles, because we don't know, you know, who is who over there. We yeah. can look at it. This website that gives us names of people. And so talk about silos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and so it will be an opportunity to try to figure out, you know, where the appropriate office would be and then make sure and send it to them to make sure they are there. Yeah, Angela, remind me, it doesn't the act and statutory mandate also require that Congress um, receive it? And I'm not sure yes, if yes. it's the FAA. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. See, I had to slow. I'm trying to slow her down because she's ready to get seen. Okay, so the first to the agent, <laughs> and then is it the agency's responsibility or Sharon's? Sharon's going to send you, okay. so I have to get her all that information so that she can. Once that's done, and then we have to respond to you to say we've received the report. Oh, okay. We've got received. Okay. And then, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, that's quick. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes, that that's quick. That's quick. <laughs> So did I answer you all's questions? Yeah, that was okay. correct. Sharon, will you send us the information about who percent? Yes, yes, that's the other thing is I had some outreach from some congressional folks um, just in the last few weeks who asked for a copy of the report, which oh. I haven't done yet. I wait until it was finalized, um, but I promised them copies. Yes. But you may, if you've got, I mean, like Brian, I know has great connections. You know, I know Tamara, you do too. Send it to them. I was going to give it the, the group that you and I and the CRP at, under the Transportation Research Board, they are they are ready for it. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yes, um, I would uh, if you you know send it to your own personal representatives as well. Yeah, all and the you're going to send it to the two committees and ask. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll and send you. By statute. Yeah, I'll send you the list of who it went to so that. Right. But <clears throat> I don't necessarily think sending it again. From a it's bad thing, right? The more times they get it, the more they oh, this is a thing I should pay. And I just read it. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> or at least the executive summary. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think if it's going to have legs long term, that's up to us. Yeah, I think it. Right? I think it's, yeah. I mean, to, to other groups too. I'm not saying it's not other groups as well, but I feel a personal sense of responsibility to to make sure that something happens, right? Even if I have to do it myself, <laughs> well, <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I was just telling Chris at the break also that, you know, this Job Corps, you know, one of the recommendations yeah. of the Job Corps, well, right. Job Corps in North Texas is running the first aviation maintenance program in North Texas. Nice. And that came from this group. And to uh, your point, you did yeah. use action it, right? Yep. It's a great <laughs> idea. There's 121 Job Corps centers, right? And yeah. no aviation. Well, we have to put aviation one North Texas signed an MOU with a school in North Texas, and in November they're going to have their first round of students. Oh, that's so awesome! It's already oh. you know, happening, which I think is pretty yeah, cool. Yeah, that's so. terrific. Excellent. Yeah, love it. Absolutely love it. So I want to go back to something that you uh, mentioned about the data in the report yeah. to mm -hmm. make sure that we're reading that. Uh, in one of our surveys, uh, want to just highlight how important it is for the ten-year-olds. Like sometimes people don't feel that they are ready, but they are ready and they are eager and their brains can definitely understand more than we give them credit for. So I'm so glad that that age group has been included in the pipeline. Uh, it's important to start early and they're ready. 
Yeah, we just have to make sure we've got the right resources for them. Yeah. Little sponges. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the biggest things for me on the report that we've talked about, and at the camera, thank you for being a pilot and acknowledging that the, all the other aviation people are actually more important. <laughs> <laughs> not exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> pretty, pretty close. Pretty close. <laughs> because, you know, you think about this, it's everything from designing to building to maintaining the aircraft. And so there's probably, I don't know, 20 people that go into in an aviation career that aren't pilots for every pilot that's out there. That, the number there. is actually 99. To 99? 99 for every one pilot there's 99 other jobs yeah. to help get that plane up in one city and down in another so yeah. yeah so you know i think it's important we really talk about those jobs highlight those jobs because those careers are super important and uh, you know it's something that we have been talking about through the entire process and it's not just the pilots so i appreciate that <laughs> Trouble I, I got 99 jobs and a pilot ain't one. <laughs> that's a new name of the report. Nobody else can use that. That's mine. <laughs> yeah. This is my, my daughter's graduation. She has a pilot. <laughs> <laughs> so, Sharon, I just wanted to take a moment to, um, to say that I could not be more proud of the, the commitment that you made to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, my role was hard. Um, as one of two African American females in a flight program in four years in an aviation program at a university, those numbers haven't changed since I left that university in 25 years. Um, the women had their task force, the youth had their task force, but there was no task force specifically dedicated to one of the most glaring issues in our industry which is not just diversity, equity, and inclusion, but the lack of equitable access, the poor treatment, and just the severe um, disconnect between um, persons of color, Latino Americans, uh, and women finding their place in an industry that has not traditionally been welcoming. And to put it in a recommendation, and to codify it as something that should be a priority for the United States to look at holistically and individually, as we've seen in the recommendations. Um, I love that you put psychologically safe spaces, hard conversations. We're not going to move the needle without doing the real work of building relationships and creating safe spaces for minorities and women to come in. And this is one of my, it's not a fear, but it's a personal challenge that I am taking on as I'm grooming young people to enter an industry that has remained 95 to um, over 95% white and male for over a hundred years. Um, we can argue that that was intentional or neglectful or whatever the case is. It's something that absolutely has to be addressed at the highest level. I believe that policy needs to be behind it in order for it to be enforced and for there to be some accountability. But I think the biggest thing for me is sending my babies into a cesspool that has broken a lot of dreams, not just with Bessie Coleman, not just with the Tuskegee Airmen, not just with the ones that I've still had to fight it. I think we forget that it was just in 1968 that Marlon Green had to sue Continental Airlines and win a Supreme Court battle for a black man to be hired as a pilot. Just 1968. So there was policy behind discriminatory practices that kept the industry white and male. And there are going to have to be policies behind diversifying industry for the future. Well said. Thank you. you know, part of, um, I said this to Angela in the hallway, um, if you see a passion for this, it's because of who I serve, right? And I serve a population of students who are 80% from a minority background and average family income is 40,000. and you know, I'm, they were right here this morning in terms of, you know, what needs to happen in order for them to be successful. And I've already seen over my 27 year career them be, I mean, lives transformed. I know this firsthand personally, but I also know the other side of it where 
just a month ago, one of my aerospace engineers who has to prove herself every time, young black woman. Same thing with a young black female pilot uh, who came with me on a trip in June, um, has to prove herself every time she gets in the on the flight deck, right? So, so it's starting to change, but we have to remain committed. And in you know a world that is changing so quickly and there's all kinds of challenges i just worry that the pressure is going to come off to make this long-lasting impactful change and mm -hmm. and so i'm hoping that this report really contributes to keeping that conversation very front and center um, you know we've tied it very closely to fixing the workforce challenge but uh it has to change uh, it has to change right mm -hmm. uh, whether you want to say diverse teams create better companies and they produce more profits okay that's fine, but it has to change. We have to refer, we have to reflect. Our industry should be at the forefront of reflecting the diversity that's in America. Sure, and I'd like to add a little bit to that mm -hmm. point that, that you and, and uh, Tamara made very, very vividly. And, mm -hmm. and it's also represented in the report, I think, uh, quite well. There's a, there's a practical dimension to this too, this mm -hmm. problem of diversity. We can't get from point A to point B unless we include diverse populations. We need a workforce. There's a deficit in the workforce, and we're not going to get the white male population alone. There aren't the numbers there. So it is from a very practical point of view, we must, as a society, include all of these people mm -hmm. in the workforce in order to have a workforce that we need to solve the problem that we've got. Right. So from a, it's a very practical issue as well as a moral and ethical yeah. issue. Right. And it's an economic issue. Not only for the people who are left behind, but and or or included, right. but it's it's an economic issue for the United States. We're not going to be competitive as a global society unless we include all the people we need to. So that makes it a strategic issue for the company in terms of global economic com competitiveness and national security. So. Yeah, and I think <clears throat> Andrew, I know you came late to the to the party. Uh, but pr one of the best comments you made and when we were editing the report was the snowball effect, right? That once you start to see more people that are uh, from a diverse background, that can only encourage more to become, right? And that eventually this will be something that, you know, feeds on itself, right? Well, that's why I love the mentoring component of this that was mm -hmm. in the report. I think that was in relation to the earth that was probably talking about that because um, the, this is a very small, very tiny group in this industry but we all work with people that can easily get out there and get the message out. And it's all your employees. Your, all of your employees should be involved in this from, the, from your first day employee that you just hired all the way up to your senior executive staff because it is a massive lift. And I think we can easily do that through mentorship and through career coaching and all this other stuff to help build that momentum. So piece too i just want to make sure that we as moving forward is that belonging piece continues throughout from the entirety of a company because that those conversations need to happen and if you you have to retain if we're going to attract and we're going to cast a wider net we're going to bring in more underrepresented groups they better be coming into a, a position and a place where the belonging is so key and i know we touched a little bit on that on the report but that there may be some opportunity to really look at that because that's really hard. I appreciate the fact that we're not just saying the buzzwords of diversity, inclusion, and belonging, but you've actually listed examples of HBCU, um, also our conversation that we had about housing authority, uh, as well as including uh, sororities and fraternities and um, just making sure that uh, places of worship uh, is also included. So not just using the buzzwords, but being specific about uh, places that we can uh, make sure that we're partnering with uh, to make it happen. Yeah, to me, I mean, that's, you know, though I, uh, you know, my team was on the expanded pathways for mm -hmm. Joe and Nancy and Joel and, and, and Jim. You know, awareness and trends are are the most important mm -hmm. in my in my mind. Mm -hmm. Because if, if I look at our South Chicago initiative, it's not the money that's the problem. It's they just don't even know, right? 
So, so though we have, and so when you, when, you know, every time I went, I, I go into a class in, in my South Chicago sheet metal class, you know, it, the, the money is there. They're going to school through, through WIOA, right? So the barrier of funding is done. They have a bus pass because that's the next barrier, right? Is getting them to school is way harder than the education, right? If I can get them there, we can educate them. And, and once they're there and you've eliminated those barriers, right? It was, well, I, now it's just awareness. They just didn't know, right? And so they, when, they, when they were made aware that there's a program in South Chicago that can get them into aviation, that's all they needed, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's why I've always thought, you know, Joey, you, you and Yvette, that, 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 that portion of this report to me is absolutely as critical as, I mean, they're all important, but that's where, to me, I really noticed that, you know, just from my own experience, you know, being very deliberate, you know, and I think that's another thing I've heard about, you know, the, the whole diversity issue is if you're not, this is hard work and it's deliberate on behalf of an organization to, and or, or a group of organizations to, to be successful. And so, you know, I really, I really commend what you two have done because that's what I really noticed, at least in my own experience. I, I money, AR will pick up the tab or or WIOA will pick up the tab or there there's always some place to, yeah. th to find that, right? I at least I feel like it. Um uh doesn't mean that funding isn't important because it is. Uh, but I, I, I just, I, I, I was really impressed of, around this awareness and the data that it, you guys dug into to really create the report that, that needed to be. Okay, created. just for the recording, we don't all have the money that we need. <laughs> <laughs> You made a good point about the trends in the in the awareness because we did see that. But one of the things that I think we do well in the report is laying out awareness building. Because the first awareness point is not the end all be all. Right. It could be for a young person from a different back, social economic background with access and a family member in aviation. But even when we were approaching our project in South Chicago, it was almost too good to be true. Two years in school, free training, you give yeah. me a bus pass and I can make $79,000 a year in two years? Yeah. No way. We have plenty of people. No, we have plenty of people that didn't, not, that oh, didn't turn out because yeah. they did not believe it. Yeah. And so the awareness building, we're gonna have to spend time building yeah. awareness around that program. And guess what? Bringing those graduates back to speak yes. and yes. be the face of that yeah. program yeah. because Ryan, you and, and, uh, and, and uh, God's name so it's slipping me right now, the instructor, Bradley. Bradley. And you guys did a great job, but you're gonna have to bring those black guys back. Yep. to talk to those kids on South Chicago yeah. because they're going to be the ones to sell the future of that program. Mm -hmm. And Joel, the same thing at AIM over in on the, on the South side, you know, we're going to have to bring those graduates back and they're going to have to become the face of the mission and become brand ambassadors and mm -hmm. training ambassadors because they just, well, it took us a while to get people to believe that two years from the starting point that they would make it. And one of my students, uh, Armand, was one of my students, one of my mentees, the first, one of the first people to go through the first cohort, text me months ago, Ms. Holmes, I just completed my power plant and, and now he's working. It was two years ago that he met me at a table at a career fair for the Department of Aviation. And I said, don't go to any other table. You're done. Sign up. <laughs> Sign up with me. You know, I'm going to send you to this. It was 17 people that filled out that, that contact form. He was the only person that followed all the way through to the end. And now he's going to be making sixty thousand dollars a year, and that's gonna he's going to add ten thousand dollars or more yeah. instantly. Yeah. That's awesome. So awareness bu building that awareness over time, yeah. especially for dis disenfranchised communities and young, and young people who have been let down, you know, over and over again. That's why, like Sisters of the Skies, if you've ever seen anybody seen them speak, mm -hmm. so powerful, right? This is a group of, uh, I think it's mostly United. 
a black female pilot? This is the um, woman who's a woman who was a United. She was actually my flight school. She went to, oh. she was a senior when I was a freshman at SIU. Oh Mia Wardlow. Yes. What incredibly powerful stories yep. about, you know, their career path. And, and they are all about giving back. I had a student who was looking for a mentor. I reached out to Sisters of the Skies. They said, absolutely, send her over. So, um, you know, that see it to be it is so important, it really is. I think that this is something that we all need to uh, embrace. This is not something that any one organization mm -hmm. can do effectively mm -hmm. yeah. or, or alone. The American education system is very different than education systems around the world. Sure. It's a bottom-up system. There are 16,000 school districts. They're all independent. Within those school districts, many of the schools are independent. Yeah. They're all doing their own thing. And getting information out to those people is not a trivial matter. Yeah. It requires a whole community of people getting the information out because they're all over the place and there's no one organization that can reach them all. We so found. we all have to work together to be able to make this yeah. effective. Yeah, absolutely. Anyone else? Okay. Sharon, Sharon? Go ahead, Casey. We'll okay, I, I just, I can't leave without making sure I say thank you for your passion, your leadership throughout this whole thing. Um, it's been an honor to be a part of this task force and I'm thrilled that we're gonna leave this having accomplished our goal, right? And having laid out a clear roadmap to progress as I think you said in, in the report. And I know we all wonder how many future engineers, future pilots, future mechanics um, have we missed out on? Are we missing out on right now because of the status quo? So um, it's time to shake up the status quo and I'm thrilled that these recommendations are gonna do that and that we really are laying a path to leaving this industry in good hands. So. Thank you all very much. Oh, thank you, Casey. Okay. Really appreciate it. Terrific. Thanks for your help on the trans committee. Yeah, yeah and I'm happy to host that Midwest barbecue out here, you know. Oh, awesome. Maybe not, maybe not <laughs> January through March. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sharon, one thing you you uh, almost an offhand comment at the end of your presentation was uh, you, you said uh, we should share our successes. And uh, one thing that I've, I've seen is that when, when there's a formal way to do that, celebrate successes, mm -hmm. it often breeds more successes. Great point. Um, yeah. I was on a, uh, at the board of our accrediting body 10 years ago, and uh, we decided, uh, hey, some schools are doing community service uh, completely outside of their educational thing, you know, giving the community. So we created a community service award, and we found over the following several years more and more schools started doing it because there's an award to compete with. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And and also um, uh, because it, it highlighted, oh, this is a good thing to do. And then right. so next year I'll do it and two years from now I'll compete for the award. And it just kind of, you know, um, I guess what I'm saying is uh, celebrating through an award process can create good behavior where, um, where, where, where we need it. So I don't know if there is a way for either the FAA to say, um, we're going to have a, uh, a highlight successes in the form of some kind of annual award about um, uh, creating opportunity for uh, for young people and, and people in disadvantaged communities to uh, to join, um, or if it's a group like ATEC, which some of us are on the uh, Aviation Education Council, or or, or whatever. Um, I think if there is a way to um, uh, to highlight and make it public and and you know, make, make organizations, give organizations a chance to show off and, and, yeah. and, and whatever it could promote. I think more that's a great country. idea. I, I know a group that does this a lot on a regular basis. They run a magazine <laughs> for our industry. Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah, we yeah. all talk to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to put him on this. I don't want to put them on the spot on national. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a great point. A great, I think the FAA might be challenged to do something like that because I could just see there being all kinds of roadblocks to mm -hmm. them being able to award. Yeah, and I don't and, know. And it could be complicated. Of, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think a group that probably, you know, does that already. Yeah. Uh, and has been very supportive of us as an institution. Okay. That I'll I I will definitely I'll work on that. I'll take that on. So, yeah, that's great. So, and what a great suggestion. But raising the awareness, but I, I think the FAA and other Federal agencies can help raise the awareness. Oh, yes, I know absolutely. That, uh, for example, the, Just the Obama awards. administration uh, had a White House science fair every year. Mm -hmm. And they brought kids yeah. and programs from across the country to the White House mm -hmm. and they highlighted them with the president. 
Right. And that was a way to raise awareness without necessarily getting into all of the legal stuff yeah, about yeah. awards. Right, right, right. And so agencies can do that at that level That's too. That's a great point. You can invite people in yep. and recognize them for making a contribution. Mm -hmm. You don't have to give them an award, but you can give yeah. them recognition. Right. Yeah. That's a, yeah, sorry to our FAA friends. <laughs> it's not in the report, but that's a great point. Yeah, use use the assets that you already have. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Hey, Sharon, it's Whitney. Yes, go ahead, Whitney. I also just want to say thank you guys for allowing me to be a part of this task force. It's been an amazing experience and it's been wonderful working and getting to know all of you. Um, I think going forward, you know, getting together organically, however we can and, and maintaining contacts will be very important as we discuss how we disseminate and how we all continue to give back. And maybe as as we do that organically and we start to get together, whether it's a few of us or all of us, maybe we include the women's board also since their work was so um, crucial and a part of what we we wanted to piggyback together. So if we all the two task force continue to organically become friends and work together to disseminate and push for change, then um, then together, I think we, we, we definitely can do that, help to increase awareness and make change um, as it happens over the next few years. Yeah, that's a great point, Whitney. There's 30 of them and 21 of us. So now you're talking about real numbers. <laughs> that's a great point. Anyone else? Okay, I'm taking a formal vote. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to vote now. This feels very stupendous, <laughs> right? You know, we're going to vote formal as far as you know, as formal as I ever got. Um, <laughs> I was just like getting cursed at any of these. So, uh, all right. So, uh, could I have a motion to approve the recommendations? So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I okay. You bet. You got oh, it. Yeah. Ready? Uh, Ants on the buzzers. <laughs> Can I get a second? Second. Okay. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? And with that, the motion passes. Yay! Yay. <laughs> now I finally feel lighter. <laughs> <laughs> So last last part is we found some fun typos this morning. <laughs> I believe those have all been fixed. Um, I will send out the link as soon as the meeting's over to everyone, the final link. And don't read it because I don't want to know about any more typos. <laughs> uh, I'm hoping this becomes a wonderful reference tool. That's why the little pie piece is in the corner so you know which section you're in um, and that it gets used far and wide as a great example of, of how to get started in your own communities uh, and and really just you know look forward to seeing the next steps and, and what the FAA can do and, and I mean it we really are a resource I don't think I think I can speak for all of us you know we are more than happy to support you in any way that we can going forward uh, with whatever tasks you have or input you need or we're all very happy to to continue to help and work hard to make this a, a reality. So thank you very much. So um, let's see here. I had some talking points, but after listening to the presentation given by Sharon, what I felt was the passion behind it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thankful and honored to have been a part of this. It's I sense the sincerity from all of you all that you really wanted to change. And that's how change starts. And as Tamara said, you look around the room as an African-American female and you don't see yourself. But you just learn how to adapt and deal. I've had a wonderful FA career, government career, but I had to I had to learn how to deal with things, you know? And I had to encourage myself to know that I knew what I knew and that I was good at what I did mm -hmm. and to ignore the noise around me. And so being a part of this has just really been an honor. Really mm -hmm. wow. And I'm just thankful for what you all have done because I believe it will make a difference because I believe you all took the time to really give us some data 
to give us the impetus of why you say what you say, to give us some options to use and to, in terms of how to carry it out, because that matters. Because we all have full-time jobs that we have to, you know, so this is something we do on the side, you know, and we want it to be more than just a side job. We want it to be something that we all are so much more intentional about and trying to get it done. And so thank you for over these two years over Zoom. So thankful that we've had the opportunity to come in person and get to meet you guys. And you know, I think what you all have provided will have an impact. And it's, it's not gonna be a quick turnaround there. It's not gonna be a quick turnaround. <laughs> but it's something that I think we all are committed to. We really want to see that change take place. And so thank you to all of you all for your sincerity, for your willingness. You know, and just wanted to be a part and just really wanted to make a difference because that's how things get done. And so moving on from there, once we do receive the report officially, do not send it out before we receive it officially. Yeah, I'll let you know when you can send it out. <laughs> but once we receive it, we will post it to our FAA um, committee's website. And the way the statute language was written again was once the report is submitted, it will officially sunset the test score. But that doesn't mean you all sunset, you know, just the test score sunset. <laughs> <laughs> so you all can continue to communicate and do what you did. And lastly, I want to say for the task force's general awareness is that you all, I think you received the email, so I want to make sure you all take the opportunity to promote the Fall 2022 Aviation Safety STEM Career Symposium that FAA is hosting. That's next Thursday on September 29th from noon to 6 p.m. The virtual event will engage middle school students, high school, and college students in a fun field day aimed at encouraging them to pursue careers in STEM and aviation. For more information, please see the email that was sent to you. And again, you guys, thank you so much for all that you've done. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.